Hello, everybody, and I thought I'd do an early lesson or lecture, we should say, uh, just to get things going. I've had a lot of questions about lighting and what does it mean when I say a lighting motif. So I thought it'd be a good idea to get this out to you early before next week. So for all the people who are asking about lighting motifs, what that means, I am going to talk about it a little bit. But first, we're going to talk a little bit more about lighting in general. So this is a quick start. Um, I have a presentation that I usually do in person, but now we are doing it online. So that's cool. And uh, let's get going. All right. So let's first talk about color. And most of you guys probably have heard this before, but uh, what happens it, with objects is that uh, all these different color ray of lights, the spectrum, the full spectrum of light is typically coming out. It's hitting a surface. And then what we see, what we perceive with our eyes is the color that is not the spectrum of light that is not soaked into the object. So we're actually getting reflected back uh, the red so you would almost it's in a strange way you'd almost say it's actually not red it's just perceived as red so the white objects reflect the entire spectrum and the black objects absorb all of the spectrum all right let's go on these are terms that you may see when you're working in 3d stuff or just talking about lighting in general um, refraction so refraction is when light hits into a surface and then bends and then goes back out a very uh, obvious way of seeing this is if you put like a uh, straw or a spoon into water and it looks like the spoon or the straw is bent when you look at it from the top down that's because the light refra refracting is making it look like it's bent it's not actually bent it's just an optical illusion uh, so it bends and you also have something called caustics caustics are what we use to describe these focused light rays that happen from the action that had the uh, bending of the light from refraction. So uh, this kid who is burning an ant evilly, that's like an example of a caustic ray that uh, actually can be dangerous, can start a house on fire if you're not careful. All right, so complex refractions, something like an orange. Uh, we also would describe this as subsurface scatter. But uh, this is what's happening is, is that the surface is allowing light in and it's got a lot of different materials and bends going on, but yet they're still somewhat translucent. So you're getting light that's bouncing around. It's making this thing look glowy. Uh, it's very neat look and uh, it's actually kind of enticing. Now that I'm looking at the orange, I think I want one. Uh, but uh, a good example of complex refraction is stick a flashlight in your mouth and go into the bathroom and turn off the lights and look at your your face glow. Or glow. That's commonly in 3D known as subsurface scatter. So it's basically just the scattering of light uh, underneath the surface. So um, let's go ahead and look at some other stuff. Reflection. Okay, so reflection. Smoother surfaces like a mirror or chrome have a basically like a linear reflection coming out it's going to which what where it hits it will bounce at the an angle going outwards uh, like a 90 degree angle um, so uh, when you are in 3d you'll see a little specular highlight and they call it specularity this is actually a faked reflection it's not real Back in the old days of the old computers, when I started using stuff, reflection was extremely expensive to try to render. And the computers were just really, really slow. And reflection takes what's called ray tracing, meaning that uh, rays of color, rays of whatever's in the scene have to bounce and have to trace to the camera. So that kind of thing nowadays is a lot easier to do when we have our you know 14 core machines with our massive graphics cards and stuff but back in the old days that was very expensive so what they did is they made this thing called specularity which is basically a fake and it's just based on the camera angle and you can change how your specularity works based on the camera angle uh, you could also put maps on your objects that 
make the specularity more or less in certain areas based on the value within the map in that area. So we've done that in class, um, but that's, again, it's all kind of a fake, but you can do real reflections uh, in a, like a render like Maya has Arnold. You can do real reflections and it will do ray tracing. And nowadays with a decent computer, it's not too bad. But uh, it's one of those things that if you can get away without using it, that's all the better. Okay, let's move on. All right, a diffused reflection is something like a Lambert material. And a diffuse reflection is when the light rays come in, but then they get scattered so much that they look soft. So a good example of this would be like a cotton shirt. So there's so many fibers going in so many different directions that technically it is reflecting off light, but it's happening in such a erratic and uh, undetermined way that it looks like a, you know, just kind of a glow to it versus a hot, uh, hot uh, highlight. So that would be what a diffuse reflection is like. All right. So let's just talk about shadows for a second because that's important. Uh, this is some terminology you may never have to deal with in your life, but I just thought I'd throw it at you. Uh, because when I was studying lighting back in the day, I came across all these things. And uh, it's, it's you know, if you get more into lighting, you will definitely uh, come across some of these these terminal, terminal, ter if I can talk. You'll come across these terms and so first we'll talk about uh, obviously this is a shadow uh, it's being cast by the earth and the sun's the one uh, casting the light out and you have a penumbra the penumbra is the area between where the shadow is 100 percent and where it fades off to not seeing any shadow it's kind of like this fall off of shadow okay and then you have the umbra and the umbra is the area where it's completely shadowed, completely black. And then this antumbra, I've never come across this term when I was working, um, but uh, it's where this, this area is here. You can see how once these cross over and you have that, uh, that in-between area that's not the um penumbra and not the umbra. Uh, I don't know how to describe that exactly perfectly, but uh, that's what that area is called. There you go. All right. So uh, now that we've kind of talked about some shadow terminologies, which you may never have to use again, we will go to the next thing, which is just talking about the properties of the shadow. All right. So um, direct lights like a sun. The, the sun is considered a direct light because it's so far away. And by the time the light rays get to us, they're basically like parallel light rays. So they call that a direct light. And it typically makes a sharp shadow. Uh, you'll, you'll notice, like let's say you're looking at a telephone pole and the sun's hitting it at a certain angle. Uh, depending on the angle, it'll usually be sharpest when it, where it's closest to the bottom of the pole. And then as the pole goes out, you'll have like a, the, the shadow will have more of a penumbra in it and it'll be a little bit softer on the end. Um, typically when we're doing things in 3D, uh, I wouldn't say that there's like a hard and fast rule. Sometimes you're trying to copy reality, sometimes you're not. I always like to do a little bit of a softer shadow than a super harsh, like uh, sharp line. Now what you will get a really sharp line with is if you have something like a an LED light, something that's like a pin size light, really, really small, you'll always get like a really sharp uh, shadow coming off of that. So these are things to just be aware of because when we're in 3D, we have the ability to make our, we can make what's called area lights. We don't necessarily have those so much in, in Sketchfab in the real time viewers, but in something like Arnold, you have an area light and the larger an area light is, um, you can get these softer shadows because what happens is is that it acts just like this slide before, like the sun. You'll get these penumbra areas, okay? Um, so, in this case, oh, I went too far. So, in this case, you can see these sharp lights. This would be like a, a really harsh direct light or like a um, pin light, like a LED. But once you get into like a bigger light, if you had this big area light, you would get something that would have softer shadows like this. So, um, or like a cloudy day, that's another example. It's really, a cloudy day is like 
a large area light. They call that like a soft box. Like uh, photographers will use soft boxes, which are basically like these enclosures that they put a product inside of and then they take pictures and of the product while it's in this like white box that they have lights on the outside hitting the white box that basically softens out the light and gives you these nice soft shadows and it just is it can be very attractive we um like i said an area light can give you these nice soft shadows if you have area lights from multiple sides you can get the same thing so um sky dome is another thing that we use uh, in in Sketchfab, we have those HDRs, those uh, those la they're they're basically backgrounds of real places that people took pictures of and they stitched them together. Uh, HDR stands for High Dynamic Range Image. Those High Dynamic Range images are images that they have extra lighting uh, embedded in each pixel. So um, what it does is it will light your scene. You can actually have light emitting from the pixels that lights your object so the extra lighting that's embedded in there the way that they do that is they take multiple pictures of each uh, of each image and they stack those they take them at different exposures and they stack the extra lighting information like so if you have a really low exposure uh, it's going to be dark and you'll you won't get much uh, lighting information but if you have a really high exposure it's going to be too much light and they take a range of pictures in between there and then they stack that range within each pixel and th those pixels can actually light your scene just a little background on how they do HDR lighting okay so here's another subject we have color temperature so the temperature of light is different depending on how warm or how cool it is what's interesting is that we consider this like warmer and we consider this like cooler, but actually they're getting hotter as they go up to here. So even though it looks more blue and you think of cool and blue together, this is technically a hotter light. You can see this is 10,000 Kelvin. So light is, is uh, measured in Kelvin is the term that we usually use. And incandescent lights, the kind of like the lights that you think like a light bulb those are usually going to be in this warmer orangey type of glowy area and then daylight is going to be somewhere in this area so this is what you think of as a normal daylight type of light and then you can get into cool lights and those are actually hotter as far as the color temperature goes so that's a hotter light all right so um oh i should probably mention one more thing about this uh incandescent lights came first uh, other than obviously natural lighting that we have outside but incandescent lights like as far as our inventions came first because we were first using lights like like this that actually had a filament and there would be an electrical current sent through it and it would heat up and get bright those came before we had uh, kind of like fluorescent lights and LED lights and stuff like that so these type of lights will denote when you're lighting a scene and you're using like these warmer orangey type of lights it usually makes the scene feel a little bit more antique or older whereas if you start to go in this area it's a little bit more just generic and then maybe more sterile uh, is over in here in this area so the the color of the lighting the lighting temperature can affect the person's perception of time when it comes to lighting so just something to think about all right translucency versus opaque okay so here's the surface right here uh, this is considered it's technically an opaque surface but it has translucency in it just like the orange that we looked at earlier there's layers of cells that are within this plant and those layers of cells allow some light to pass into them and kind of scatter around but it's actually coming through the whole object out the other side it's just being scattered a lot before it gets out the other side so um, if you have a transparent object typically you're going to have some bending of light and we would call that the index of refraction is how we measure like what that bend of the light is uh, and then with translucency you're going to have some reflections and you're going to have some scattering as it goes through and that's what we're going to see here so with like a leaf if you if we were to flip over this leaf that we're looking at on the screen 
we would be able to see that on one side you might get some reflection you might get like a shiny leaf but then on the other side you're actually having some light pass through it as well so you're getting this like green glow which is what we're looking at and then you have something that's 100 percent opaque and that's where it's hitting the surface and bouncing right out so depending on the nature of the surface you can see um, materials and lighting go uh, hand in hand so b based on the nature the lighting look can look different too so if, when you're making a material you have to think about um, like how does this play with the lighting those are two common things that you do together okay so volumetrics here's another term that we might hear in the 3d world volumetrics is basically when we think of particulates in the air and those particulates uh, when light passes through it they basically light up and they actually are occluding the light a little bit and as they're occluding it they're uh, or I should say blocking it they're lighting up and they're making these like fog look this is a picture that I took in Hawaii and I was at uh, this area where there was tons of sea turtles but there was also a freshwater spring that was mixing with salt water and what it did was it caused tons of uh i don't know what the chemical properties was exactly happening but there was tons of like particles and agitation in the water between with, with the salt water and the fresh water mixing together and i took a picture underwater of this this turtle but you could see the this fog and all the light catching onto all these particles and the mixture of waters going on right there. So that's why I threw this picture in there. All right. So let's talk about like actually lighting things and making things look interesting through lighting. So the, getting into more of the practical part, we've gone over just some of the steps and in lighting is a so much bigger uh, subject. It's, it's literally a job. You could literally go into, you know, work at Disney or something or some of these big companies, they have people that just do lighting. So there's so much more to learn. I just wanted to kind of talk about some brief things, but the practical side of it is like, what, you know, how do I light my scene? How do I make it look good? Uh, what do I take in consideration when I'm doing lighting? So my number one tip is complexity does not mean good lighting. So just because you have a thousand lights in a scene doesn't mean it's going to necessarily be better. And uh, you can see from these four different swatches that uh, all of these I think are pretty attractive, but they're all just done pretty simple. So let's explain what's going on here. These are, I mentioned area lights earlier. These are ex uh, examples of area lights. When a, a light actually takes up a large physical area, that's what's considered like an area light. And you can see, I mentioned earlier about soft shadows coming off of area lights. And you can see how they've got the penumbra here. You've got the umbra here. And then you also get a softness in, uh, depending on the kind of material that's on uh, your object, you can get a softness in the fall off, especially from area lights. So what we have here is three point lighting. And we've got a light that's acting kind of like as a rim light from, from this camera angle. And then we have a uh, key light and then this would be kind of like a fill light. They're actually leaving like a little darkness right here on the sphere. Uh, so that's, um, that's going to leave some contrast and help this thing look a little bit more 3D. Okay. Uh, let's jump down to this one. So this one down here, this is an example of using an HDR, an HDR high dynamic range or HDRI high, dy high dynamic range image to light this sphere. So uh, whatever the scene was that they used for the HDR, like they took the pictures and stitched them together and took the multiple exposures, uh, it, I'm not sure where it was, but it had a lot of light in it. Obviously, it had this, some kind of like light streak. Maybe this is a row of windows or something like that. And uh, so you're getting some soft lighting from the environment. They put a they put a reflective surface on this, so you can see that the HDR is reflecting off of this. Okay, so up here, let's jump over here. We're looking at this is like the same as this, but now they've introduced some color some in in not a ton of color just basically like that warm to cool that the kelvin uh the lower kelvin numbers to the higher kelvin numbers and it's the same setup as here but the adding these colors into into the mix is very dynamic one of the things that's happening here is that blue and orange are complementary so 
using a subtle blue and a subtle orange is going to make uh, more contrast and you're going to get certain areas popping out and, and it's going to draw the eye to it. So when you're lighting a scene, when you're thinking about what, how, how do I light a scene? You want to think about like, well, what do you want the viewer to see? What do you want them to feel? These are two things that, that come into play. Now, because this, this orange and this blue are very common in nature, we see this a lot in film and movies in games there's a lot of there's a lot of um there's a lot of people who color grade a lot of artists who color grade and they use the uh, teal and an orange color grade because it's very natural to our eye but they what they do is they they'll ramp them up on both sides like the teal will be more intense and the orange will be a little bit more intense just like they've done here because it really pops and yet it's natural so people accept it because you know our our sun is basically orange and our sky is basically blue so it's basically the the normal thing that we're used to seeing our whole life i like how they threw a cube in here so you can see how like based on flat you know different directions see the bottom here how this is like it's kind of the same blue as this but it's a little bit darker and that would be because of the uh, occlusion that's happening which means that there's less light bouncing and there's less light in this area than there is obviously coming from here which is getting these lights directed right at the side here uh, this brings to another topic which is bounce lighting and uh, bounce lighting is what happens within a scene normally is that you're getting lights that are bouncing off of surfaces and bouncing back onto other surfaces and in 3d terms we usually call that global illumination and global illumination is something that's very very commonly used uh, back in my days my early days like i talk about global illumination was extremely expensive for the computer to calculate we used it but we didn't use it a lot because it, it just took so long to use. So, but nowadays with the, the faster computers, we can get really nice looking global illumination uh, for less cost, or at least it's just because everything's faster. So what we see here is, uh, I wanna talk about the fact that even though this scene has, there's no direct light hitting this underside, with the global illumination, it still has some light on it. So it doesn't drop off all the way to black. And that's one thing that, that uh, you want to take note of in most of your work unless you're doing something very graphic that you know you need to have that black there for some reason typically you don't want to drop your um, your look or your your shadows all the way to black because it just rarely rarely ever happens in nature where anything ha is just 100% black the next time you have your your lights off in your room uh, just look around and most of the time there's some kind of light in the room that you can still kind of make out some stuff unless you have like a special setup for everything being blacked out uh, you know so there there's almost always some ambient light going on so um, that's a, one thing to take in consideration when you're lighting so uh, for instance look at here underneath here even though this is very dark here it doesn't go 100% to black and same thing out here and even out here these are probably not 100 percent black but this is probably the closest in this whole uh, scene to having some black okay this right here is interesting this is just a one point lighting setup with some global illumination that's what's giving you like these background glow here how you can still see the other side here but what they are using is they're using like a light blocker or some people call it a gobo um, it's they're using something to block to cast shadow on the light to make the subject look more interesting and this is very very common in Alfred Hitchcock movies back in the day a lot of filmmakers use this to uh, just make their lighting look a lot more interesting and it's really actually cheap because you just got to throw something in there to block the light out in this case it's kind of looks like blinds you know from a from a window or something like that okay so that's uh, it's a lot of talking about just in this one little area here. There's a lot to talk about. Okay, so here's another thing uh, that that's used a lot. I talked about it up here. I said rim lighting once, but this is very commonly used rim lighting, especially in Pixar movies. I don't know if I've ever seen uh, any 
<laughs> any part of a Pixar movie that doesn't have rim lighting on one of the characters, you'll almost always see these like highlights that are right at the edge. And the reason why they do that is it really helps define the character off of the background. So having the rim lighting is almost like drawing like an artist drawing a line around their subject. But you're when you're in 3D, we don't typically draw the line around the subject unless you're doing some kind of tune shading. So in that case, or in this case, we're using a rim light to really make that him pop off of the background. And obviously this picture right here that I put in here is like an extreme example. Uh, really, really bright rim light. Okay. Uh, oh, one other thing to talk about, this is not about lighting so much, but uh, both these pictures are using um, focus. They're using a, a certain field of view. And typically when you're using doing character stuff, you always want the focus to be on the eyes. You notice the background in both these pictures are blurry. So the lighting mixed with the focus allows you to direct the person's eyes. And that's a lot about what uh, being good at setting, composing shots is all about, is being able to direct the person to see what you want them to see and feel what you want them to feel. In this case, there, it's no uh, accident that this one eye right here is lit up and has like some light right there. They may have put a light out here specifically just to shine and make that eye light up. And that's fine. You can totally do that if you need to do that to make your scene look good. Um, so just, just keep that in mind that uh, it's all about eye direction. All right. Tip number three. Sometimes you can break the rules. Can anybody see what uh, what rule is broken in this scene? This is a great scene, by the way. I love this. But um, let's see. Break them with caution. I haven't even talked about what it is yet. Can you guys? Do you guys know what's going on here? Well, let me ask a question. Where is the sun? Hmm. Okay, we know where the sun's at. Now, where are the shadows? Where are they at? Where do they look like they're being cast from? Where where would this where should the sun be in this picture? Hmm. All right. If you guess that the sun should be way up here, right above him, casting straight down, you are right. Because look at the way the shadow is falling. Right. So we got the shadow there. We got a shadow falling straight down here. We don't have a shadow casting out towards the camera. But if the sun was actually back there, you'd have a cat. You'd have the shadow actually casting towards the camera. But that's not what's happening. So you can break the rules sometimes. You just have to be careful when you do them. All right. So here's a little bit about composition. All right. Uh, I've probably talked about this in class already, but if I have not, I'll go over it again. We can all see that this is a square, right? And uh, yeah, great, square. But this is, if we know Maya, we, we could probably already tell this is a 3D object. We're like, wait a second, that's a square, but it looks like a Maya interface, so it's probably 3D. Okay, let's look at this one. So we got one and two. It's looking a little bit more three-dimensional, right? Now we can we can tell that there's, there's two sides to it. Uh, okay, what about this one? One, two, and three. So... One of the things that I learned way back when was this term called one, two, three, read. So when you're trying to make an object look three dimensional, let's say, you're wanting to consider is the depth being able to per be perceived by the person who's watching it. If the person who's watching it, like if you're looking at this, you don't really know that that's anything more than a square. And then you get number two here, and you, you can say, well, that's probably something else, but it's it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, and then all of a sudden with this, now that you have these three dimensions that you can see, the perception of three dimensions is, is easier to read. Okay, so this is all about composition and when you're showing off something. Now, remember, if you are doing anything in video and film, uh, where the camera moves, you can change from this to this to this. That's that's uh, one nice thing, and you could even use that as a composition uh, tool to uh, to change the viewer's perception right in the middle of a frame. But if you're showing a still frame, of course, uh, you're going to want to take in consideration 
the one, two, three read for sure. Okay. And here's the biggest thing I've already mentioned it before, but think about how you want your lighting to affect the viewer. All right. If you haven't seen Stranger Things, this is from Stranger Things. I'm not giving away anything about the story, but I'm just showing one little scene. And when you see this, uh, what do you feel? What do you think? How is it perceived? All right. So at the end of the day, you can change the mood and emotions of scenes through the lighting choices you make. Color, atmosphere, soft, hard, bright, dim. What do they? What do you want them to convey? Uh, in this scene, I see mystery. I see um, red lightning, which seems dangerous and scary because I've never seen red lightning. And I see something that looks kind of like a spider. And spiders are kind of scary. I also see silhouettes, so it's dark. And there's thick atmosphere, too, meaning it's dark and foggy. Think about if you're in a deep fog in the dark and if there was flashing red lights around you, what would your feeling be? That would probably freak you out because you no one's probably ever been in that situation before unless you've been pulled over by the cops. <laughs> Anyway, I just thought of that. Well, maybe you have. Uh, so anyway, but the point is, is that most people have never been in that situation. That would kind of be sort of a freaky situation. Well, that's what they're playing on here when they show stuff like that. Scary spider, red light, fog, silhouettes, impending doom, and it's conveying a feeling. And and this is what we love because we're we get that that feeling of spookiness and scariness and yet we're still safe at our couch so we love that all right okay so practical lighting uh i have a couple videos i think i have one for sure that i want you guys to watch uh, that i'm going to add to this uh I'll, I'll just send a link with it uh, that I want you guys to watch, and it's important. In the, uh, in the video, this guy's going to go over some of these qualities. Uh, he's very good at lighting and showing like the difference. So uh, he has really good lighting equipment too. So it shows some good stuff. So let's go and exit out of this full screen, and we'll just look at some practical examples. Okay. So has anybody ever seen? Has anybody ever seen uh, The Exorcist? I will not watch that movie again. I've watched it a couple times, and that was enough. I have to say I am kind of a chicken about those things. I can watch certain kinds of scary movies, but that one scared the dickens out of me. I don't know why. Anyway, this is a scene from The Exorcist, and if you've seen the movie, you probably understand like who this is and why it's so spooky and where the lighting's coming from. But this overall look is just really gives that same thing that the Stranger Things did, which has that thick atmosphere, uh, silhouettes, nighttime, mystery. This guy's alone on the street. It's damp, so it's probably it looks damp and cool. These are the kind of things that, you know, whatever that emotion is you want to convey, right? Uh, let's think about, so we have like the, this right here shows three point lighting. That's, that's, uh, one thing to consider 45 degrees, 45 degrees backlighting. Okay. I threw this in here cause I was, I just, these are such wonderful lamps. I know this is silly. I didn't, I just saw this and I was like, that's lighting right there. <laughs> okay. We'll skip that. I just, uh, this whimsy. I just love that lamp. All right. So anybody, if anybody has that lamp, send it to me, please. Okay, so let's go into some other lighting stuff. So here's stuff from uh, Blade Runner. If you haven't seen Blade Runner 2049, it is a spectacular movie, especially when it comes to uh, lighting motifs, lighting sets, uh, stylized sets and setting moods. Now, I'm not 100% sure exactly what, if there was a specific mood the author was trying to set or I say author or the, the cinematographer director was trying to set with each one of these scenes, but so many of the different scenes have kind of this different mood set up based on the lighting. I'll show you another picture in this one. He's, he's, well, I don't want to tell you where he's going if you haven't seen it, but it's a great movie. You should watch it. Uh, he's, uh, in a desolate land. I'll just put it that way. 
and with the heavy atmosphere and the uh, the feeling of kind of like this dry clay desert color now some of this stuff is not all coming from just lighting they're doing a, what's called post-processing color grading on this so the they probably shot this with a with a regular type of plate a regular type of exposure type of thing with their camera it probably looked pretty normal and then when they got it into the post processing software whatever their color grading software was then they go ahead and tweak the colors out and they make it look like this and it, it gives the feel of just like desolation and isolation and um, yeah I think that's enough said about that one more from Blade Runner this is more in the beginning of the movie and same thing here you got this like super heavy thick fog you've got a dead gray tree everything's gray and dead so what do you think the director is trying to say with this kind of setup this you know this grayish type of looking almost even a green tinge you know so speaking of green tinges let's jump into this one if you haven't seen the matrix uh matrix came out i think in 99 or maybe a little bit before that uh the matrix was uh, i would say the star wars of the 90s so like star wars just made a huge change in filmmaking and i think the matrix made a huge change in filmmaking when it came out so if you haven't seen the matrix it'd be a good watch uh but one of the things you'll notice in this scene it's not so much of the lighting all itself but it's the green tinge if you haven't noticed do you notice the green tinge every time they're in the matrix inside the matrix in the movie the it has a green tinge to it and it's supposed to feel like confining and um sort of this artificial look so i don't want to give away the movie or anything like that but if you haven't seen it of course but uh you'll notice that this um this is kind of this uh this ongoing theme that always happens when they're inside the matrix and then when they're out of the matrix here's a scene from when they're out of the matrix if you notice the same movie same same character keanu reeves but there's no green tinge it's more cool and bluish looking and i don't want to give away the movie but there's reasons for that so i'll just throw that down all right oh it's supposed to be this one first okay monsters university love this movie fantastic again if you haven't seen it this is like being on the purdue campus almost except for you know we're not on the campus right now so uh let's see this is a scene from the beginning of the movie and you got mike and he's look you know he's going around and he's it's all cherry and bright and you got all these people showing all these different clubs anybody who's been to university has been has seen this kind of stuff so it's it's great uh but you can see it's light it's cherry it's it's bright it's sunny and then in this scene which i should have showed second in this scene when hard scrabble comes into the scene all of a sudden the tone changes and you can see we've got volumetric lights we've got this red obviously she looks creepy because all the legs and that's if you're afraid of bugs like that which i definitely probably have some fear of uh there's you know it there and there's this this like isolation of lighting right here so all of a sudden this is a very intimidating looking person with an in in, in intimidating scene and so you could see just the difference between how this scene would make you feel versus how this scene would make you feel. Okay, so let's get this. We're at 40 minutes. We're going to wrap this up soon. Um, this is, I, I watch, I'm, I've been into photography for years. I've been following this guy's YouTube channel for years. He's got over a million subscribers. Um, pretty funny. If you're into photography, you know, give it a, give it a go. Uh, but he puts out these fro packs. He calls them fro packs. Uh, basically, they're just they're uh, they're packs that that are post processing for Lightroom. So Lightroom is where you would process your pictures and stuff. Uh, which it's probably what most pro photographers use. There's other programs out there other than Lightroom, but I usually use Lightroom. Uh, and I just want to show you like here's like some you can actually scan between the difference when you put on one of these uh, 
post-processing filters. And some of it, this is going past kind of like lighting, but but lighting and post-processing kind of go together. So you can get mooding mood from from not just the lighting, but also from the post-processing. So for instance, like here's here's this rock concert. And I think this is a really cool picture altogether right here. That's that's really cool. But then you go ahead and like turn it black and white, and it's gonna have this different feel for it. And um, maybe more nostalgic, you know, very contrasty, it's very artistic. Uh, same oops same kind of thing here where we have kind of this just normal picture it's a good picture nothing wrong with it but then when you do this this waffle house i don't know why it's called waffle house whatever i guess this is the waffle house look it's got more of that teal and more of that orange so he's using uh, lightroom to punch up the orange and to punch up the teal and so you're getting that that uh complementary color contrast that i was talking about from that one uh, sphere image that we were looking at all right, so we got acid wash here. Wash. This is a great picture. This is this is really phenomenal, but it's unprocessed. You can tell it's kind of just kind of a plain old picture. And then you do this onto it, and this acid wash really is like punching a lot of the uh, contrast up and uh, pulling some of the colors out that it wasn't pulling out before. You can see like the teal again. You get that orange. I'm sorry, I said teal orange coming out. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this this is. Mm, I guess it's this is a little bit more harsh. This is more kind of a little softer. Uh, here's another one before after, very contrasty, but at the same time has still has like a little bit of softness in the in the um, the gradients. Uh, this one, Sandlot. Here you go. Now, what's if anybody's seen the Sandlot movie? Uh, the Sandlot movie was set in the '50s. So here's another thing to think about. Like if you want. A certain look sometimes you need to go back and see what did their images look like back then what kind of colors did they use in the 50s what kind of colors did they use in the 80s and so on and so forth and when you use those color schemes and you use similar looking uh, uh, techniques to that that mimic that look then you can get an older looking uh, type of nostalgic looking uh, image so here let's go to that's, that looks pretty normal, and then that just totally changes. I mean, look at the green grass. It turns completely brown. So, yeah, I can see why he's calling that sand lot. So, he's just, this is, and I can even, this is basically just taking green and shifting it to orange. You can do that in, in, um, in uh, Lightroom. This one's just color boomify. I this is how I process a lot of my pictures. I just kind of boost them a lot. I, it depends on what I'm trying to get out of the picture. Um, Here's one aquamarine. This is definitely that whole punching up the teal and orange. Uh, really nice cookies and cream. You can see obviously this is way different. And this is going to look like if you think about this, this kind of reminds you of like an old Western film. So I think it was appropriately used on this guy uh, works. This is really a great one too. Like this actually is a great picture. Fro is a great photographer. Uh, but then when it's post processed, it just punches a little bit more and it's a, just a, has a little bit more of a nostalgic look it's more it's just it sets it up for a more memorable view um kind of your normal picture and then all of a sudden with the contrast punched up and some of the colors tweaked this one's fantastic i love this this picture so cool and and just looks so good with the like the black and the white contrasting against each other and the reflectiveness of the skin um, really, really great shot. Maybe my favorite one in this whole bunch. All right, so um, before, after, Skittles. So uh, Skittles, obviously, he's talking about color. He's really punching the color here. And let's see, Universal Soldier before. That's pretty run-of-the-mill. And then, boom, punch it up. All right, this one's perfect. Yeah, uh, Wonder Years. So here, here's your normal shot. And then the vignetting and the colors kind of like bleeding out a little bit they're not as strong it's making it look like a faded photo so these are kind of the considerations so let's get to how to <laughs> here's the end guys we're in the last five minutes of this lecture and uh, I did this not too long ago uh, over spring break I took pictures I uh, did a photogrammetry of an uh, old radio and then I did a retopology on it so because they the original um, oops I hit the wrong button. I meant to hit five. The original, uh, the original, 
the original topology and textures that come out of the photogrammetry are not great. So I went ahead and just rebuilt it. And uh, so now it's pretty low poly. And uh, I wanted to just go over a couple things about what I was doing here. So let's jump into lighting first. The lighting is not really that uh, crazy. I just picked one of their presets. And, uh, you know, you can you can pick all kinds of different stuff if you want. Like you can tell that that actually doesn't look like it changed that much. That's because a lot of what's going on here is with this and this. OK, so without any of these lights in here, so you could turn these lights on by just switching them on right there. But if I go ahead, this actually is a kind of a cool look, too. Like it's very contrasty. And I'll talk about how I got that going because I did that in the post processing. But this is kind of a cool look. And it's uh, like if you were going into like a dark room, this this might look interesting with like one cast light or something that's actually coming now. The only lighting that's coming in now is from this uh, this little background. What I typically am using the background for is kind of more just to have interesting uh, looks over the whole entire object. And you can see you can play with any of these light intensity. Um, you don't probably need to mess with shadow bias too much. So uh, let's see here. So let's turn our lights back on. Oh, by the way, you know, you could do, you can have the shadow go off like that, or you can do the bake AO. I kind of like the bake AO for certain objects. It just depends on what, what I'm doing. Um, so we got these lights on. If I turn this back on, boom, that lightens it up. And then, but you can see this is all black. Now, I, I remember I said in most cases you don't want anything to drop to complete black. You want to be able to see it a little bit. So we turn that Hemi on, and the Hemi, as you can see, is a blue color. So that's what's kind of giving it that color. I can go in there and change that, of course. You know, you can make that totally different color. Green, yellow, red, whatever. Whatever you want. But I decided to go with kind of a natural sort of a blue color. And uh, the directional light, I didn't give any color to that. Probably should have. So normally I, what I would do with a directional light, because it sort of mimics the sun, is I give it a little bit of an orange tint, like so. Um, but it, like again, this depends on what you're trying to get out of it. Uh, you can change these lights. I can change this to a point light, which actually might be really interesting. Let's see what happens if I... Oh wait, that's the bait. I'm on the wrong thing. Numbskull. Okay. All right. So what we can do though is if you do that, you can select it, and you can go ahead and rotate this. If I can. Oh, you know what? Point light. Sorry, I meant to do a spotlight. <laughs> Point light's just a single light in in space, and it's direct. It's going out and basically like think of a like a little tiny dice and it's going out in six different directions and that's how it lights up um but it's really just one point in space where it comes from i meant to do a spotlight that's what i was actually trying to do this is what i was trying to get the rotation here so with the spotlight uh you can pull this down like so and this is nice because i can change my angle and you can see how i can start to play with where we're seeing uh, the highlights and stuff. So if I want, if I want somebody to focus on one area of this light, I can just go ahead and, or I should say, of this object, I can go and do something like that. So you see how, like now, it starts falling off to that blue on either side. So the Hemi is like a is like a sky dome, so it's kind of giving light from every direction, and. Um, that's why like when you turn around in here this kind of looks bluish this looks bluish but right where that point lights hitting looks that that orange color okay so um let's see you can see that that's nice i like that in fact i think i'm gonna i might even save this i think i like this even a little bit better than what i had before all right so but let's talk about the next thing well materials obviously i have um let me select it so there's the base color uh, metalness is zero because there's not really any metal on this thing and then I have a roughness pass in here um, we didn't get to we don't go through all that stuff in this class but um, I don't know why the emissive is on it shouldn't be on and then I have a bump map as well so that's what's giving kind of that some of that surface 
um, bumpiness and also that's mixing with the roughness. Okay. Remember, so the roughness, whatever's going towards white in your map will look more rough and whatever's going towards black will look more like glossy and shiny. And then metal's the opposite. Whatever's or whatever, actually no, metal, whatever's white will be metal and then whatever's black will not look like metal. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, that's about it for that. Um, let's go into the post-processing. This is where some of the, like the magic's happening here. So let me just turn off the post-processing so you can see like how it looks like just, it looks like a good object, but it doesn't look anything like it did before and turn on the post-processing and now it looks like kind of, kind of looks, has this older stark look, right? So we've got screen space reflection. I can turn that on. It's not really that important for this object, but uh, this the SSAO is the screen space ambient occlusion. So you can see the difference that that makes. So that's just basically doing like little shadows where there's uh, where light would be occluded because there's because there's uh, corners and stuff like that. So not as much light gets up to the corners. Um, grain. So this isn't doing a ton, but it's subtle. It's like this subtle grain that goes over it. I wanted the grain because I wanted the uh, I wanted it to look like old film. And actually, this kind of looks better even if I put it up higher. We could do animated, so it's playing. Cool. All right. Almost. I'm actually out of time, but I'm gonna keep going until this is done. We're almost done. Uh, let's see here. You can turn up sharpness. You can do chromatic aberration, which gives you these little, uh, you know, lighting. This is like when you have lenses that, that maybe aren't great lenses, you get this chromatic aberration. It's, it's something that even good lenses sometimes do. I wouldn't mess with that too much. That, that is way overdone. I did turn on the vignetting because I wanted to, um, make this look older so I can, you know, I can go ahead and just do something like that. And then you can soften it or harden it, whichever you know, but, but use the vignetting. It's the same thing. Like, a, usually like lenses that aren't as a, like older lenses will have more vignetting. Uh, some of the newer lenses have less. Uh, so you want to use that like judiciously where it's needed. Um, bloom. I don't have bloom on if I did like, you know, for emission stuff, if you're doing emissive materials here, like if you put an emissive glowy thing, then you may want the bloom on. Um, but, uh, you don't, you don't have to. Okay. So tone mapping, uh, tone mapping is, uh, this is where a lot of magic is happening. So if I go and turn up the exposure and then I turn, I can turn the brightness down. Look at that. Ooh, I like that better contrast. You can contrast it up a little bit. Uh, saturation. I can, I can go a little desaturated. Um, although with this one, I don't really think I want to, I want to kind of keep it where it was. I don't even know where it was. Where did I have it? Uh, that looks good right there. That's fine. Okay. So, so you can get some, like, definitely some like interesting looking stuff just from that. And then this color balance, this is where you can go ahead and you can say, Hey, in my shadows, I want there to be more blue. And look at that. Now you can start getting that, like there's more blue in there, but I want it to be less green. Okay. So what's going to happen though, is that there's always going to be a, a trade off between the red, blue, and green. So if you drop, like if I drop the red in here, it's going to make it look more blue and green. All right. So there you go. I don't want to do that too much. I drop the green. It's going to look more blue and red, so on and so forth. So you, let's see here. Let's do yeah. actually, I kind of like that. That's kind of cool. Yeah, that's neat. I like that. Looks old. Uh, and then, so that's just the shadows. So you have your midtones, and you can you can tweak your midtones, make your midtones nice and rich if you want, or drop that a little bit. Um, let's see. And then you can go up to your highlights. What do you want your highlights to look like? Well, I don't want my highlights to be green. You can see what that does if you really play with that too much. So, uh, you know, obviously you use these to where you think they, they look good. Um, we can, you know, add a little bit of a red tone into the highlights or something like that. Usually the, the, so the reason why I usually want a little bit blue in the shadows is just because that's normal. What we see, uh, that is the, from the sky, we usually get like a little bit of blue in our shadows. Um, so it's kind of like pleasing to the eye, but 
playing around with these are things that can give you um, some interesting results and give you kind of like a filmic look that you didn't have before. All right, guys, that's lighting in a nutshell. It's not all lighting. Uh, I'm going to have a link to a video. It's only about a 10-minute video, so uh, I would watch the video too just to learn some more and see um, some interesting stuff from the uh, the guy that uh, made the video. So anyway, I hope everything is going okay for you guys, and please be in contact with me if you need. Uh, like I said, I am here. You can contact me anytime you like. All right, talk to you soon, and happy modeling.